Hello, we we are ready. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, who stayed for this discussion in London, as well as those who joined us online. My name is Dmitry Frolov, uh, and I'm a film curator at Pushkin House. Um, I hope that you liked uh, Tomorrow Comes Yesterday and that this um, important uh, documentary seemed relevant to you. Um, now we have an opportunity to discuss it together with the complex problem of uh, political repressions against the Crimean Tatars. Um, let me introduce our speakers briefly. Um, Kirsten Gainet is a director who was born in the Republic of Bashkortostan uh, in Russia and who made the film you just watched. She's also a screenwriter, uh, photo editor and producer of the Akkosh Documentary Film Studio, uh, where she made several films. Uh, Kirsten is a participant and award winner of many international and Russian festivals. And the second speaker is uh, Maria Shenkarenka. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in the politics department at the New School, New York. Um, her dissertation explores the instrumentalization of collective identities as uh, tactics of resistance in the Crimean Tatars movement for self-determination. Uh, Masha is also a member of uh, Hramada group uh, that offers resources to the academic community to understand Russia's war in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Kirsten and Masha, for taking the time um, to join this discussion. Uh, to begin, I would like to ask uh, Masha to speak about the history of uh, repression against the Crimean Tatars, uh, which uh, began uh, long before 2014. Um, and then I would like to ask Kirsten a couple of questions about the very film, about the process of making it. Um, and after that, I would like to invite the audience to ask your questions uh, to our speakers. Uh, Maria, it is my pleasure to give you the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dmitry, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, Kirsten, thank you so much for making this movie. This is such a important, brilliant uh, movie, and I think everyone should watch it. Uh, so few people know about the oppression of Crimean Tatars, and uh, it's it's a really uh, really important movie. Uh, so I was asked to prepare a little kind of history lesson, and um, so I'm going to talk. And it's of course. Uh, very long and tragic history. So if I'm uh, talking too long, please just interrupt me and or uh, signal. <laughs> so I'll try to um, be as brief as possible. Um, so I would like to start uh, with, you know, uh, you just all watch the movie and uh, there was one moment in the end of the movie uh, during the Crimean Solidarity meeting uh, when one of the uh, elderly man uh, is saying, uh, our people have been fighting for 230 years. Uh, and, you know, where does this number comes from? And why does he refer to 230 years? Um, and for Crimean Tatars, uh, the kind of the source of all their struggles started in 1783, when the Russian Empress uh, Catherine the Great uh, conquered Crimea and annexed uh, it to the Russian territory. So uh, in Crimean Tatar political memory, this period is called first annexation. Uh, and the annexation in 2014, they refer to uh, as the second annexation. Um, so the, uh, that date and the figure of the Catherine the Great um, is the symbol of the beginning of the Crimean Tatar oppression. Uh, so as every nation, they have um, the period of the golden age to which they always refer. And that period is the uh, medieval kingdom of Crimean Hanet. Um, so that ceased to exist after Russia uh, the uh, Russian empire occupied Crimea. Um, so with that, uh, with that conquest started the settler colonialism 
uh, uh, the Russian Empire used a variety of colonial tools to Russify and Christianize Crimea that before that was Muslim and mostly Turkish. Uh, Crimean Tatars constituted 95% of the population. And uh, through, uh, through the uh, 18th and 19th century, we see the uh, land, mass land dispossessions, the destruction of, colon of indigenous infrastructure, uh, the resettlement of the region, um, bringing the um, uh, Russian um, colonial administration to manage the land to bring civilization to Crimea. Uh, so for example, if you're interested in that history, you can read Kelly O'Neill's book, Claiming Crimea, in which she discussed how the uh, how uh, this whole process of uh, imperial uh, actual claiming uh, was happening, for example, uh, when the Russian administration was giving away Dutch as the plots of uninhibited land or, or Crimean Tatar land to empire settler elites to kind of subsume the territory within the larger imperial structure. So what we see is that by the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Crimean Tatars were dispossessed of land and many immigrated to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so the population has decreased drastically uh, by, as I was saying, before the con uh, conquest, it was 95% of the Crimean Tatar population. By 1850, it was already 60%. And by the end of the century, the Crimean Tatars only constituted 35% of the population. Um, so later on, during the revolution of 1917, uh, the Crimean Tatar uh, kind of nascent intelligentsia that was educated in the Ottoman Empire, in the Russian Empire, they have began to think, uh, to kind of develop the um, strong attachment to Crimea and the, uh, uh, the emergence of nationalism all around uh, Europe and in Crimea, it was also not an exception. Uh, so for um, almost two decades, they were trying to uh, kind of envision different political projects for how Crimean Tatars can get back that uh, glorious history of the Crimean Hanat. Uh, so they attempted to declare the Crimean Democratic Republic, uh, Republic in Crimea in 1917, just like other um, nations did, like Ukraine uh, was trying to do. They were trying to create their own state. Um, but they were not able to do that. And after uh, two unsuccessful attempts, the Bolsheviks uh, finally managed to conquer Crimea and make it, make it part of the Soviet Union. Um, it's also important to emphasize that during the Russian imperial times, um, Crimean Tatars were uh, orientalized and rationalized as backward, underdeveloped, dark, prejudiced, um, and the same narrative continued uh, through the Soviet Union. Only this time in the, uh, you are probably all familiar with the uh, nationality policies in the 1920s, uh, this time this uh, status of backward people actually uh, proved, uh, was uh, promised uh, a lot of opportunities and access to resources. Uh, just to, um, uh, remind you, uh, in the 1920s, the nationality policies were implemented all around the newly conquered lands, um, and they were meant to uh, kind of uh, usher those uh, backward <laughs> nations that uh, didn't have the, supposedly didn't have the national con uh, consciousness yet, to kind of usher them through this uh, historical timeline of economic development to finally get them through that stage of uh, nationalism and to the uh, class consciousness. Um, so it was, uh, it was assumed that, um, that indigenous people are so dark, are so illiterate and prejudiced that the only way they can become a a real uh, a Soviet proletariat is by developing the national consciousness first. So that actually coincided with the Crimean Tatars' uh, interests uh, and 
because you know they were already uh, uh, kind of uh, um, nationality minded um, and they already had that consciousness. So now they were actually uh, got the resources they needed to develop their language, their cultural, political institutions, and so on. Um, Crimea was declared the um, uh, autonomous uh, region and Crimean Tatars were declared the um, titular nationality. Um, so we know that that period didn't last long and by the late 30s, um, Stalin began the mass purges. Um, the 40,000, uh, the newly formed Crimean Tatar political elite were as executed. The policy of na nationality policy was overturned. Uh, and uh, what happened next was actually the most tragic event in the Crimean Tatar history. Because in 1944, overnight, the whole uh, nation uh, was deported to uh, Central Asia um, under the uh, pretext that they collaborated with the Nazi. So Crimean Tatars are obviously not the only people who were deported. There are all the other uh, ethnic minorities that were also deported um, during that time and before. And during those deportations, half of the population died. Um, they died in the uh, trains while they were deported and they died afterwards um, in the special settlements where they were put, uh, where um, they were separated, the families were separated, there was no food. There were no sanitary conditions. They were basically used as slaves to work um, in like as a free labor force. So not only did they lose their home, um, lost their, um, you know, half of their people, um, but the Soviet state actually declared that Crimean Tatars as a nation doesn't exist. Uh, so they called the people who were referring to themselves as Crimean Tatars, they said, Crimean Tatars don't exist, you're just Tatars as Volga Tatars or anyone else. Um, so with that, uh, that meant also that Crimea was not Crimean Tatar anymore because such nation didn't exist. So uh, the Soviet Union, um, the Crimea uh, became so it lost its status as the uh, autonomous republic. It became just a, um, just a region of Russia. Uh, and the whole kind of landscape, uh, Crimean Tatar landscape, everything that made Crimea Crimean Tatar was destroyed. So the mosques were destroyed. The taxonomy was changed into Russian names. The property was confiscated and uh, Russian settlers were brought to Crimea. Um, and so also want to refer to the movie again, there were a few moments where, where uh, Crimean Tatars were protesting in Moscow uh, and uh, on the background there's Lenin mausoleum uh, and then another moment uh, where the mother of Siran Saliyev says that her son couldn't stay apart because he grew up in the movement. So he, everyone kind of uh, this idea that everyone is an activist in the in, uh, Crimean Tatar society. And uh, this is basically the reference to the movement that emerged after the deportation in, in exile uh, in the mid fifties and it lasted uh, up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was the largest um, national movement in the Soviet Union, um, the nonviolent movement and it fought for the ability to return back to Crimea. So in 1967, uh, when most uh, deported people were rehabilitated and were allowed to return back to their homelands, Crimean Tatars were rehabilitated, but were not allowed to return. Um, so some of them tried to return, but they were deported again. And uh, for 40 years, they were um, petitioning, uh, organizing underground uh, networks. And basically that, you know, they say that all Crimean Tatars were participants of that movement because everyone wanted to return to Crimea. 
everyone was doing whatever was possible in those circumstances. And finally, in 1989, they just started uh, to return themselves unorganized sporadically. Um, and um, the hundreds of thousands of them um, came back with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, do I still have a little bit of time? Yes, uh, yes, sure. sure. Okay, uh, I'm finishing. Just wanted to uh, say a few words about the uh, kind of the, the next 20 years um, that they lived in independent Ukraine. Uh, so when Crimean Tatars returned to Crimea, finally, uh, this was not really a happy homecoming because when they returned, they were not welcomed in Crimea. The Crimean uh, elites were using them as scapegoats uh, for uh, to explain the political and economic crisis in Crimea. In the, I mean, the early 90s, there were crises everywhere. Um, and that kind of, but that uh, nurtured the, that uh, atmosphere uh, on the, uh, in Crimea that always felt like there's gonna be an ethnic conflict, there's gonna be some kind of a um, spill out. Um, and um, Crimean Tatars were, um, denied the access to basic resources, housing, education, healthcare, employment. They, uh, instead of the um, uh, promised uh, package of repatriation, they didn't get that. They actually were forced to just squat the land, just like many indigenous people around the world do. They just reclaimed the land back because they were just not giving it. Um, and I kind of argue that even, even when Crimea was part of independent Ukraine, it still remained the Russian settler colony um, where Russian citizens always enjoyed more rights, more privileges than Crimean Tatars. Um, and I say that because first of all, demographically, it basically was <laughs> most of the population was the Russian settlers who came uh, to Russian and occupying the houses of Crimean Tatars. Uh, the uh, military of the Black Sea Fleet. Um, then the second reason is that Russia still continued to uh, its economic and cultural expansion in Crimea. Um, it co-opted political elites, infiltrated the law enforcement, cultivated discourses to discredit the Ukrainian state, and um, Crimean, um, Crimean political elites, uh, they've never recognized Crimean Tatars as indigenous people, and they never took responsibility for deportation or, or for all the um, uh, other injustices that were happening. So it's a situation where basically the victims are living side by side with their perpetrators. and their perpetrators are living in their houses and they can identify those houses, but they can't take them back and they can't even argue for any sort of restitution. And Ukrainian state uh, failed to actually counter this to take any meaningful action. They were trying to, they were too afraid of the uh, conflict with Russia. They were trying to appease them pro-Russian politicians and population. Uh, and uh, I think that's like one of the reason that the annexation actually happened. Uh, and I'm gonna stop here because I know that we're, we'll have more time to talk about what's actually happening now. But yeah, thank you so much for watching that movie and thank you Kirsten for making it and uh, for Dmitry and Timothy for organizing. Um, thank you very much, Maria for such a, such a detailed and important insight into the history of the Crimean Tatars. Um, I think I have a couple of questions for you, but um, I'd better hold them for now, uh, thinking of time we have. So now I'd like, I'd like to move on to the very film uh, and to turn it over to Kirsten. Um, Kirsten, hello, thanks again. And uh, could you please tell hello, us? And yeah. hello, for, hello everyone who came to the film, film screening. 
this is film screening is very important for Crimean Tatars and for me. And I want to uh, say special thanks for you, Dmitry Khalov, and for Maria Shankarenko uh, for her great work and uh, for all uh, participants who uh, make film with me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your organization, this film screening. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm very, I'm sick a little bit and uh, can I turn off my video? Uh, sure. But I will be with uh, you and uh, I can answer for all questions. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, so my, my question <laughs> is, uh, how are you personally connected with the Crimean Tatar community and uh, what basically prompted you to, to start working on it? Uh, before, yes, uh, because I interested with the uh, human rights topic and um, uh, today's documentary filmmaking for me is a powerful uh, tool for releasing one's ideas as well as express one's activities toward various situations. Uh, I make films uh, dedicated to human rights and uh, my first film about him uh, about uh, Turks mishitian people deportation in 1944 from uh, Soviet Union in Georgia maybe Maria Shinkarenka maybe she know uh, she knows uh, and uh, uh, this is film has been screened at more than 45 40, uh, seven international and Russian film festival and um, uh, the, the next film my uh, the first feature film, documentary, uh, name it Wife. Uh, the focus of the film uh, is the heroine, a wife whose husband is in prison for life on a fabricated case. Uh, this is normally a fabricated case in Russia. And uh, this film was very important for me and for Muslim community who was oppression in Russia. And um, the next film, Tomorrow Comes Yesterday, today's film. Uh, this is film, uh, uh, I think it is my opportunity to apply my artistic and technical tools to the struggle for human rights. This is film very important for crimean uh, Tatar people's uh, community. And uh, I started uh, make film with uh, Lutfiye. She um, human rights activist, and I met with her on Facebook. She helped me organize uh, organization filming, and uh, uh, she helped me choose heroes. And uh, I asked her for three different heroes by eight characters, and but they connected with one tragedy and the story and oh. uh yes yeah, yeah okay uh thank you kirsten uh you you just mentioned uh that uh, um Lutvier, Lutvier helped you in uh, organizing the screening in crimea and i wonder um like uh, did you face any Kind of oppression from the Russian authorities during filming uh, your your work, uh, because basically you you did it during the Russian occupation of Crimea. Yes, yes, right. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Lutfiye, she uh, very um, very strong and uh, human rights activist she work she have very very great work in crime and uh, she very helped me and i want to thanks for her uh, thanks a lot because uh, i think without her i couldn't to make film yes yeah okay uh, maybe just uh, one more question um the there is uh, a boy, uh, Marlena, son of son, Said, in the center of the film. Um, uh, so I suppose he's a, a representative of the um, uh, 
young generation of Crimean Tatars. Uh, and it's, I think it's very powerful that uh, he decided to become a lawyer and chose to join the, the, the peaceful struggle of the Crimean Tatar people. Uh, but did you manage to communicate with uh, uh, anyone else of the same age, with teenagers? Um, uh, what are their moods uh, about this political struggle? Uh, interesting, but all ch children of the Crimean Tatars, they are very similar to each other with the strength of spirit. All Crimean Tatars children, very uh, smart, strong, and uh, I asked three children who they would like to become in the future, and uh, they all answer uh, about lawyers, uh, uh, human rights activists, and uh, help their people, and uh, it is very imagined for me. I think all be all uh, children of crime that are very similar with say, Said, with Said. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I think I also have a question to both of you um, because uh, I think it's important to talk about what, what is happening with the Crimean Tatar community now. Uh, could you please share the latest, latest uh, disturbing news uh, with the London audience? Um, uh, with Crimean Tatar, uh, yes, of course, I, uh, I, I try to be in touch with human rights activist Lutfiye, and uh, I, um, I ask her for all news in crime and uh, about my heroes and about situation uh, with Crimean Tatars. Today we know about this very hard situation and uh, uh, and we uh, planned to make a premiere film, the first screening film for crime and Tatar in Kyiv before war in October the last year. Uh, but because we have today's uh, not good situation, uh, we, we doesn't happen this uh, screening. And, but maybe in the future we can show for crime and Tatar this film. But really, my heroes, uh, they uh, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't see, uh, see this film. It doesn't look this film. I do hope they manage to, to see it uh, at some point. Uh, Masha, would you like to add something? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the last eight years has been very, very difficult, uh, as you've seen in the movie. Um, I mean, those are just a few families um, that were in the movie, but um, there are more than 100 people now imprisoned with uh, like 15, 20 years um, yeah. sentences. And um, so that obviously affects the whole community, but the uh, recent most uh, horrible thing that happened is that um, Putin is mobilizing the Crimean Tatars yeah. to yes. fight against um, the Ukrainian army. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, it is a horrible tragedy, obviously for everyone, but for Crimean Tatars, um, I mean, first of all, it is, of course, the disproportionate uh, mobilization of uh, indigenous people, um, as opposed to uh, everyone, like everyone else. Um, so, eighty percent of the um, summons come for the Crimean Tatars. So, if, for example, before there were whole villages in Crimea uh, that are just uh, women. So all men are in prison and you ha you walk streets and it's just women. So now, uh, and Crimean Tatars refer to that as the hybrid deportation. So they, you know, kind of thought that it is impossible in this day and age to actually, you know, get people and deport them en masse. Uh, so they called that that hybrid deportation that they are just arbitrarily taking people and you know throwing them in prison 
but now that uh, fact that they are actually uh, like literally taking men from the streets and uh, Crimean Tatar men and sending them uh, to war uh, from which they will likely not come back alive is, uh, you know, um, many people interpret that as the genocide, um, potential genocide or attempted genocide. Um, so Ukrainian government is trying to um, provide some uh, instructions, not just for Crimean Tatars, but, but all residents of Crimea, because Ukraine still considers uh, the residents of Crimea as uh, Ukrainian citizens. And, um, and um, so they are trying to come up with some instructions how to avoid the draft, how to you know, try to hide and not get summoned, how to um, become the, uh, like get into Ukrainian captivity uh, where at least their lives will, you know, they will save their lives uh, instead of just being killed. Um, so obviously everyone understand that the situation is just uh, impossible and horrible and um, really devastating um yeah yeah indeed um and i think um uh, it's uh it's very um, good the... it's very good point about mobilized situation in crime today yes of course it is very um uh horrible and uh, big suffering of all crime and tatar peoples because they uh, don't know what to do uh it is really horrible I yeah, because so. they can't, uh, it's not that easy for them to leave because um, the uh, the only like um, kind of border that they could come to Ukrainian side, there was two, like three and then two checkpoints that were open um, yes. where you could travel to Ukrainian side. Now they are closed. So there is no way that they can enter because those territories are occupied now. Um, yes. And then they can, they also cannot really go uh, without any problems to the territory of the mainland of Russia through the Crimean Bridge, because there they can also be stopped and questioned. And, you know, it, it is very, very likely that those people who will try to do that will get summoned just right there. Um, so it's very... Um, hard to see how they can actually get out of Crimea physically. Um, and also it's a very important to know that uh, the vast majority of Crimean Tatars are very pro-Ukrainian. And that's another reason why they are so oppressed in Crimea is because of their position, because in 2014, they have been the only um, kind of um, the, the most important uh, pro-Ukrainian force that was able to mobilize politically, to go on protests, to, um, you know, demand um, uh, or protest against the annexation. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of Crimean Tatars have fled since 2014. Um, so tens of thousands of Crimean Tatars are actually in mainland Ukraine. Some of them are in the army. Uh, we have a Crimean Tatar volunteer battalions and it's like sending people to basically just, uh, you know, families healing uh, one another. So yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Yeah, very difficult situation. 19% uh, they are received, um, I don't know, Pavieska. What is it? Pavieska? Pavieska. Some, letter. Someone, yeah, someone a letter. Yes, yes, yes. 19% uh, from from all Russia, they, they are received. This, this is very <laughs> deportation, yes, on prison, on war, on the prison and war. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's time to check if there is uh, anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question. Is there anyone? Um, yeah, if, if, oh yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, it's um, working. Thank you for your wonderful film and for the thank you. introduction. Thank you so much. So. Okay. Um, is it working? It's working, yes. Thank you very much for your film and for the introduction to the history of Crimean Tatars. I just had um, a very small question actually about the, um, the there's some shots where there's a, a kind of, is it a YouTube channel or a news channel? Because I was wondering what that news channel was and you know the the how it and whether that yeah, broadcasting is still going on and um and who was doing it it was it was quite interesting it seemed like kind of independent news for by Crimean Tatars for Crimean Tatars and for anyone else of course who wants to listen so yes i yes can i can i used uh i used materials from uh, independent news uh, from Ukraine and uh, from uh, from crime and solidarity solidarity. This is um, this is community of crime and Tatars, and uh, I used uh, all news and materials and uh, video stories from independent um, from independent uh, news. Uh, only from Ukraine, not from Russia, because uh, Russia has not independent uh, system of information. Yes. Can I say just uh, one thing about that? So I think you're talking about Krim Reali. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, so this is the Radio Liberty um, uh, news source. Uh, they are only talking, uh, reporting on the situation in Crimea, and they uh, started in 2014 after the annexation. So they are based in um, in Kiev, but they have uh, reporters in on the ground in Crimea who usually use anonymous names and um, uh, write blogs there, and um, that that this is how they are reporting. They very support uh, Crimean and Tatars. I see. Very support, yes, and support it in Tibetan. Uh, is there any other questions in the audience? Hello, yes, thank you. A terrific film, very interesting. I wondered what um, uh, Russian Muslims thought about the, the plight of the Crimean Tatars? Are they thought of as a kind of cause celebre, a kind of uh, a group that is um, a, a rallying point for other Russian Muslim nationalities? I mean, Russian within the Russian Federation, I mean. Uh, I, I can say, I can answer. Uh, all nationality and all Muslim, all Muslim in Russia, uh, they they pressured in Russia. Uh, I don't know why, but this is very hard political from uh, from um, today's Putin. All Muslims and all nationality they oppress it, and uh, uh, I'm Muslim too. And I lived in Ufa. This is uh, capital city of Republic of Bashkortostan. And uh, I uh, I moved to Istanbul because I make uh, because I make film with human rights and about political. And I don't agree with political today's. And uh, uh, yes, it is very hard situation with uh, all Muslims and, uh, and other nationalities. But with crime and Tatars, I think this is, uh, this is situation have the first, um, uh, the first problem in our Muslim community. 
in Russia. Yes. Yeah, okay, is, is there any other questions? Um, actually, I just wanted to draw attention to the, the film as a film as well. We've talked very much about the content, but and you obviously can't separate the subject matter from the making of it. But I was really struck with uh, the beauty of the way you filmed it and the, the kind of the portraits of people and the, the kind of the patience with which you hold the camera and also notice very, you know, thing, uh, you know, times of day and, and kind of domestic gatherings and the, you know, enjoyment of the place and the beauty of Crimea. I mean, I've been to Crimea. I was there in 2012 and it's, you know, absolute tragedy what's happened um, and is happening. But you really, you really attend to that as well. And, and that, that kind of makes, you know, to me that, that's really important. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the making of the film and the, uh, the, the kind of your feelings about it and, and the decisions that you made. I know that's a very big question actually, but you know, maybe just a couple of things about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, too. Yes, I tried to make film, um, not like a TV. Sorry, uh, can you repeat one more time, please? We just was a sound off. Sorry. Ah, okay. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I tried to make film, not like uh, uh, not like as a TV with hard interviews, and um, I tried to make film with um, patient camera, like obscure. Uh, watching heroes who they who they uh, do who they make and uh, for for deep feeling uh, this story and uh, maybe maybe so yes and uh, I don't use um, expression music for uh, emotionally because uh, this story is emotionally, very emotionally, yes. And uh, maybe so look like a um, patient, patient camera and patient, um, uh, patient style, style of my film, maybe. <clears throat> um, I think we have just a bit of time maybe for the last question. Is there anyone who wants to ask something or maybe make a comment uh, yes thank you so much for the great uh, film um, just also addressing or uh, connected to the question asked about uh, Muslims in Russia I thought it was very interesting to maybe compare it a bit uh, I myself come from a Muslim republic in Russia as well. Um, and if you have a look on the recent events, um, like I come from Kavadina Valkaria, it's close to Dagestan, Chechnya. And the region, of course, majority Muslims, and what you could follow was that they did support or still do support the government, of course, like also the war against Ukraine. Mm. And also considering that now, like with the forced mobilization, it's a bit maybe unfair just to say they simply support the government or it's like a simple conclusion to make. Because if you consider the socioeconomic conditions from the set of options they have to choose from and in general the opportunities a person from the region has it's like very limited and yeah just putting this into the context and trying to explain why there is like a majority of muslim people in russia who support the russian government like very strongly and of course it's connected to history and also how you 
mobilize identity, religion as a part of identity and creating this Russian belonging where it was like more successful probably in that regions. Yeah, just maybe would be interesting to hear your opinion, like it's a long question, but just your opinion on how you can explain the differences in like, yeah, how people support the Russian government or oppose the Russian government. Uh, are you asking Kirsten or Maria? I think it is a question for Maria because this is very uh, difficult, um, difficult story. I, I think Maria can answer. Well, I don't um, really, I study Crimean Tatars and I don't really know that much about other um, Muslim um, people in Russia. But um, I guess, um, I guess you are right that there are, um, you know, economic and uh, social structural conditions that um, that make the um, Muslim people, indigenous people in Russia more vulnerable and um, uh, that kind of account for uh, why those people get mobilized, why they don't, why they come, um, why they even in the first place, why they go to the army uh, because the opportunities are limited. Uh, but then when you look on the ground, what these people are doing in Ukraine, when they are there, uh, you know, the rape and the killing of civilian population and all the possible war crimes that are happening, you just wonder what money can, you know, justify that? Like how, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, even if you are going to the army, because that's your only source of income. Uh, that's the only way how you can earn money. I don't see how the crimes they are committing uh, can, you know, account for any of that. Um, and you know, the many people who are coming, they are not just some lost soldiers who don't know what they are doing. They know what they are doing, and they also are repeating the same, you know, Russian propaganda about the Nazis and all that. Um, so I find this question very hard because on the one hand, uh, I obviously sympathize with all the oppressed people. And um, um, I obviously think that it is very unfair uh, that minorities are the ones that are kind of uh, bearing the grunt of this war but uh, at the same time i find it very hard to remain sympathetic after uh, just you know knowing what they are doing um so yeah that's kind of my opinion i don't know like probably not answering your question at all um but i also you know it's interesting because crimean tatars for example you know they have they have never uh, internalized that um, kind of uh, orientalism or um, this whole like Russian world discourse. They have always resisted in the you know you know for um, for centuries, and even now they continue to resist. So if you look at the last eight years in Crimea, they weren't just sitting, uh, you know, idly uh, you know sucking on Russian propaganda. They have been organizing and, you know, the, those trips that they are doing to um, to uh, support their people in the, um, uh, in the in the detention centers at the core tri uh, trials. This is just the tip of the iceberg, um, you know, and um, they are there is a lot of uh, it's not I don't want to call it hidden resistance because it's not really uh, that hidden uh, or um, passive resistance. It's just a different kind of resistance. It's the kind the behavior that we don't usually associate with resistance, but in that particular context, it is because they, you know, there is a reason why they are being targeted by the Crimean authorities. Um, so, for example, just one uh, one example is that um they 
they continue for over eight years now, they continue to, um, to just uh, promote the Crimean Tatar culture uh, that is being constantly uh, assimilated and russified and they, they don't allow that. They, you know, they, the, uh, the Crimean government is trying to deny them the opportunity to study their native language and what they're doing is actually talking in their native language on a daily basis with each other. Uh, the government isn't allowing them to um, have their, you know, to express their ethnic identity and they do it on a daily basis by wearing Crimean Tatar clothes or organizing festival style and shows like all kind of they are shooting movies um they are shooting comedy shows um and it's it might seem like it's not really a big deal but it is because they are you know they are not allowed to do that and they are still doing it um and uh, so i think in the in the case of the crimean tatars i think we actually get a might have a chance to see um some some form of um resistance or uh i don't know maybe i'm being too <laughs> optimistic i know it's a very difficult situation but i don't i actually i know these people like the people from the um documentary there are lots of familiar faces i also have been in crimea doing the research there and I just cannot imagine any of them actually, you know, coming to Ukraine with like with the Russian army and like killing there. I find it very hard to imagine something like this happening, um, which I, I mean, <laughs> it's different from, um, from the rest of the Russian Muslims because Crimean Tatars are actually, they have lived in Ukraine for 25 years and they consider themselves Ukrainians. So there is the diff big difference. And uh, the, there was also uh, an activist in the film who said that they got some support from Muslims from Ufa, if I'm not mistaken. So I suppose there are different Muslims in Russia as well. No, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, I think we need to wrap up. Uh, so thank you all but before saying goodbye uh, i'd like just to read out a message uh, from human rights activist and journalist uh, lutfia zudiva uh, which she sent to us through kirsten and i i also have to say that the uh, this the recording of today's discussion will be published on our youtube channel so you you'll be able to return to this message at any time later so here is the message uh, as well as a huge military presence, Russia has established a vast network of enforcement structures in Crimea, in particular the FSB. Uh, all, of the, all of these enforcement bodies need to somehow prove that they are doing something, and FSB officers are eager to earn themselves bonuses or promotion. By initiating criminal prosecutions against Crimean Tatars and fabricating a non-existent terrorist threat, Russia is also trying to convince the international community that its presence in Crimea is justified. Human rights defender and journalist Lutfia Zudiva, Zudiva asks the spectators, first, uh, to use political instruments to facilitate the release of all political prisoners, uh, most of whom are Crimean Tatars, to invite human rights ombudsperson uh, from European countries and independent uh, negotiators to take part in negotiations aimed at achieving this. Uh, 15 of the political prisoners are old uh, in their 50s uh, and 60s with several, uh, and, and several of them are in extremely bad health. Um, the Russian authorities must release them uh, as a matter of particular urgency on humanitarian grounds. Uh, the term of imprisonment uh, which Russian courts had down are in fact death sentences. The Crimean Tatars imprisoned under Russian legislation um, 
on terrorist and extremist charges have nothing to do with the terror with terrorism and uh, uh, they state this publicly in court uh, they express their civic political and religious views solely through non-violent means and reject any intimidation or attacks on the population they are persecuted and sentenced to huge terms of imprisonment without any crime uh, and under Russian law. Such persecution should therefore be viewed as a crime against humanity. Second, uh, to organize in mainland Ukraine, Turkey, the Baltic Republics and other European states, different platforms for discussion, uh, for discussing the issue of political, ethnic, racial, or religious repressions in Crimea. Third, uh, to strengthen uh, legal defense for lawyers, human rights defenders, journalists, activists, and other individuals working directly in Crimea, to organize the permanent presence of uh, to organize the permanent presence in Crimea uh, of human rights defenders under the auspices of the OSCE, the Council of Europe, and the United Nations and non-governmental organizations. And fourth, and the last one, to demand an end to violations such as illegal arrests in Crimea uh, that are taking place now, and to ensure that these are prevented in the future, and to also take measures to reinstate the rights of victims of human rights violations. Uh, that's it. Uh, again, this message will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Kirsten and Maria again for taking the time uh, to join this discussion. Uh, I would also like to thank Russian decolonial researcher Sasha Shostakova, who helped a lot and basically made this event possible. And of course, uh, thank you very much to all the guests of Pushkin House and the viewers who joined us online uh, for your interest. Um, Thank you. See you later at Pushkin House screening. Thank you, bye. Bye.